This is the tale of a Pandora's box, unleashed with the discovery of the largest emerald in the world. Emeralds are glittering glamour accessories, but there's an ugly facet to the lucrative gem trade. A lot of my life is selling beauty at the feet of the powerful. Prospectors dream of unearthing the ultimate emerald. It's kind of the gambler's feeling that you can come out here and maybe get lucky and find that special stone. But one special stone has exposed the worst facets of human nature. It's a cartoon-like caper of alleged crimes, corruption, and incompetence. This is the legend surrounding a giant gemstone that promised untold riches, only to be a curse to many captivated by its ill-fated allure. A record-breaking bonanza emerged from the gloom of a Brazilian mine in 2001. A dig in the eastern state of Bahia exposed a rock embedded with massive emerald crystals. From that moment on, the glittering jewels would become mired in greed. One of the protruding stones was as thick as a man's thigh. The miners had never seen such a mother load, but knew they'd found a fortune. It weighed more than a third of a ton, a stunning excess of more than 180,000 carats of alluring emeralds. What happened next is the subject of conjecture, a story that's become blurred amid the shimmer of a staggering stone. To thwart any ambush by bandits, the miners apparently loaded their riches onto a mule cart. But even then, the giant gemstones appeared to bring bad luck. It seems the multi-million dollar mule train was attacked by some kind of big cat. Some say the miners had to carry their treasure out by hand. Others say they hauled it out by truck. Whatever happened, the giant emerald made it onto the streets of Brazil's largest city, Sao Paulo. It was claimed to be the largest emerald ever found, worth some $400 million. But at least eight people have claimed it belongs to them. That's just part of the scintillating, sordid, and surreal story of the Bahia Emerald. The allure of instant fortune attracted a colorful cast of characters, each hoping to stake a claim. They included two Brazilians, who apparently unveiled the emerald to American businessman Tony Thomas in Sao Paulo. What happened next has been the subject of a bitter legal battle. Thomas said he was brought to the viewing by fellow American entrepreneur, Kenneth Canetto, who claimed to co-own the mine where the massive emerald was found. Ken Canetto said that Thomas went bananas, ecstatic, like he was having a fit. Tony Thomas said the Brazilians offered to sell him the Emerald Rock for $60,000. That he agreed and would come back to pick it up and send them the money from the US. But both the Brazilians and Ken Canetto denied that any such offer was made or accepted.
Tony Thomas said a picture of him holding the stone backed his claim that he'd bought it. The photo was submitted in court. But would the alleged owners really sell a gigantic gem for a mere $60,000? It was only the start of a story that's as lurid as the brilliant green gem itself. Emeralds attract all kinds of attention, and every stone has a story to tell. Diamonds may be forever, but a perfect emerald is worth much more. The finest green gems are mined in Colombia. The small region of Muzo produces the world's most valuable emeralds. Discerning buyers know where to go. I'm an emerald obsessive. Yeah. Experience, instinct, and a keen eye are essential. No, no. It's muy pequeño, muy pequeño. Lo siento. The most sought-after stones are deep in color, high in transparency, and large in proportion. Size matters in the emerald business. Such stones are rare because a combination of specific geological events is needed to create them. Colombia is unique in having such a geological history. Tectonic forces turned ancient sea floors into mountains. Sedimentary rock fractured under huge pressure. Superheated water carried minerals that leached out of the rock. Those minerals included three rare elements, essential for the formation of emerald crystals. Bonus formations of iron pyrite, or fool's gold, kept iron out of Colombian emeralds, resulting in a unique, natural fluorescence. The Bahia emerald is from Brazil. It's not as fine, but it is very big. The Bahia emerald, as a geologic specimen, is worth way more than if you were to facet out the gemstones. A geologic specimen resonates with a certain type of person. I am not that type of person, but it's a lot of people that they just want the biggest, even though it's not necessarily the best. Big was beautiful for American businessman Tony Thomas. He claimed to have bought the Bahia Emerald for $60,000. He also said that the huge gem was hidden in a garage in the Brazilian capital, Sao Paulo, while the sellers threw a surprise party for him at a local hotel and even presented him with a bill of sale. But a family accident back home interrupted the alleged party. Tony Thomas's story is while I'm at that party, I get a phone call from my wife. And I tell her, oh, I'm at the Delavope Hotel, we're celebrating. <laughs> Thomas testified at trial that his wife had said, you need to come home immediately. Our son broke his arm, and you need to come back home. They get on a plane and they go back to San Jose that night. So we had to leave it behind. From what I understand, he had a family emergency back in the States and he figured he would return later to crate up the stone and have it shipped. He leaves the emerald, he admits. Uh, he never takes possession of it. He leaves it under a piece of canvas on a dolly in an unprotected building. The businessman went on to claim that when the stone wasn't delivered to the US, he called Brazil to find out why. He says the Brazilians said, never gonna believe this. This thing got stolen during shipment. And Tony Thomas's story is, and he said, oh, what can we do? You're not going to be able to do anything. It's Brazil. They're never going to go after this thing. It's, you're going to waste your time. And uh, he said, well, look, I, I, didn't think, uh, I didn't think I could do anything about it. That was 2002. And in 2002, he believes that this rock has been stolen. And therefore, he forgets about this rock. It was just the start of a smashing story of a seemingly cursed stone that brought nothing but trouble.
Behind the secured door of an exporter's office in Colombia, the gems on just one table were worth many millions. Half a million, hundred thousand dollars, over one million dollars, easily. And this is just a Monday afternoon. Right there is one hundred thousand dollars. Million dollars, fácil. Alea sin comedor esquilate. See, one hundred carats at 15,000 per carat wholesale price is one and a half million dollars. 20,000 a carat, minimum. Three million. Three million four hundred. Sixty thousand dollars. Sell one of these, you could buy a car. So two or three, a house. This is the true use of money, to buy something beautiful and eternal like a gemstone. Of course, you need to survive and eat and be sheltered, but beyond that, gemstones. <laughs> Some of the world's finest emeralds come from a small area no bigger than a small city. Colombia's famed Muzo mining region is only 140 kilometers from the capital Bogota, but it takes seven hours to drive there. The stones sold to a privileged pampered elite are extracted from damp, dirty excavations deep below the ground. Right, so we have permission to go in according to Juan Manuel. And we can go in three or four of us. Okay. Okay. Sí. Sí. Juan Manuel is telling me about the, the bonanza, 25,000 carats of emeralds were encountered within 50 yards from here at, at another mine called Mina Real. And they are right here with a shaft that goes straight down. That's the entrance to their tunnel. And they'll, they're going down 90 meters already. And from 90 meters, we'll be walking about 100 meters in either direction. There's two tunnels and two gangs of workers down underground. What he was explaining was that they're, they're looking for calcite veins, so they're going through a lot of dark, soft shale. And shale is what underlies all of these mountains here. And it's a sedimentary rock, but that's what the emeralds come in. De eso se trata de trabajar nosotros. Ir perforando, ir haciendo el camino donde encontremos betas. No se encuentran eh, relativamente cada 10 metros ni cada 50 metros. No sabemos dónde podemos encontrarla. Ahí es donde entramos nosotros a explorarla, a buscarla. Si la beta se profundiza y se nos da como idea, nos pinta como tal, entramos a darle unos días, dos días, meses, si ella nos pinta, nos da la posibilidad de que en ella hay esmeralda, le damos hasta que ella nos dé, ella nos da el punto. No, aquí no hay nada más que paramos hasta que llegó su, su pinta de esmeralda. In this case, a promising vein thinned out into a rocky ribbon, too small to support quality emeralds. But they would continue to chase it, in the hope it would lead to a thick load of glittering green gems. Las, eh, las, las vetas, que son como de cuatro dedos, es blanca, es una franja de este estilo, pero más ancha, donde posiblemente encontramos la esmeralda cuando se encuentra en beta. Cuando se encuentra en beta, se encuentra en una parte como esta más ancha, blanca, ahí está incrustada la esmeralda. The rock faces surrounding such veins are blasted out piece by piece. In the hope that the ribbon of white calcite will get wider, leading to emerald encrusted rock. But dynamite blasting is relatively crude. A vein that changes direction could be accidentally blown up, ruining any emeralds inside it. This is the mystery of emerald geology. The emeralds are not in any predictable place. You can only guess where they probably will be, but then you just have to start digging holes. And the, the shafts and tunnels that go underground for those mines literally perforate the hills. And the decision to go to the left or to the right or up or down is really not made from geologists. It, it's just made from the men that are underground using their intuition to find emeralds. 
cuando se presenta la oportunidad, no puede decir que cada tres meses saca el de un frente o cada 20 días o cada seis meses. Eso, eso es algo fortuito, algo y, y, no, no, y difícil de entrar a determinar cuándo se saca el Meralda. Que todos, por supuesto, desde el más grande hasta el más pequeño, eh, estamos eh, esperando esa suerte que nos dé la vida, como se dice, de poder encontrar la Esmeralda como tal. When immortal emeralds are unearthed, the mere mortals that do the hard work are forgotten. As the stones are cut and polished to adorn the delicate fingers and necks of the ultra-rich, who inhabit another world, far from the graft and grime of the Colombian mines. The Brazilian Bahia Emerald was inferior to Colombia's fine gems, but it was the largest in the world. But after brokers couldn't find the right buyer, it ended up in the United States. It was going to take a little bit more to get this stone sold because it required such a specialized buyer. Somehow, it never glittered with the glamour associated with other emeralds. Uh, at one point, the Bahia Emerald was hidden in an abandoned gas station in San Jose. While other gems were snapped up in exclusive jewelers, the Bahia Emerald was flogged on eBay, but didn't make its 75 million reserve. And another potential sale was destined to drown in an infamous disaster. This is like in April, May 2005. So it was placed in a, a, a closed bank vault. It's an old bank, it's apparently got like, you know, vaults like three floors down or whatever. Not anticipating that Hurricane Katrina is gonna come hit New Orleans and put the city underwater. When Hurricane Katrina hit, the vault and the stone were under 16 foot of water for about two months. There's no dispute that the Bahia Emerald was underwater for some period of time. They pulled it out, and I don't know if scuba divers did it or whatever. Quite a colorful history for, for one emerald. The promise of quick riches drives droves of treasure hunters who sift through the tailings piled up outside the Colombian emerald mines. The buyers, or Esmeraldos, wait nearby. Traditional white towels draped over their shoulders. The tailings are washed downstream, where others hope to haul up gems missed by the miners upriver. People in the river digging and they come back day after day because uh, they know a brother or a cousin or a friend that found a nice big emerald that, that changed their life. And it's very random because the specific gravity of emerald is only 2.67, so the emeralds are not much heavier than the little rocks around them, so they, they don't gather in any place. The, the emeralds are just scattered throughout, so you have people digging randomly and, and they'll find random emeralds. He said he finds things from $50 to $100. He knows people that found things up to about a value of six, $700. But uh, basically, everybody here is here because they found something. Right. Pasta. With this, he can buy lunch and dinner. It's not worth much, but uh, around here, it keeps people going. Muy amable, señor. Suerte. La esmeralda es suerte como esta y muchas mejores de muchos millones igual las encuentras tiradas Colombia's lucrative mines have also attracted criminals especially during the unrest of the 1980s civil war emeralds are easy to smuggle and were a boon for corrupt officials and organized criminals who used them to launder money Like Africa's blood diamonds, illicit proceeds from Colombia's emeralds also helped fuel a spree of mayhem and murder. I'm Douglas Ferra. I was the Washington Post bureau chief in Latin America from the late 1980s to the 1990s. Absolute chaos. You had multiple armies out there. Everyone was sort of defending for themselves. And at the same time, you had the person of Victor Cajansa who sort of brought these multiple currents together in a really unusual fashion.
Victor Carranza controlled the Muzo region with a private army that became the largest paramilitary force in the country. Those who could afford to formed their own armies, and Victor Carranza was one of those who could afford to. He had his emerald money, he had his drug money, and he was able to arm a group of two or 3,000 men that could protect his interests against not only the FARC, but against the state and against any other armed actor that wanted to come in. So it lasted for a significant period of time, several years of this really nasty war. And in Colombia, the rural wars were always incredibly brutal. They used really grotesque ways of communicating that if you came into their territory, this is what would happen to you. Not much attention was paid to it at the time because there wasn't a place where the press could get to easily. Kajansa controlled access in and out of there, so you couldn't just decide, let's go visit uh, Kajansa's mines this weekend because you, you weren't likely to come out alive. Los acá no corriendo, había muertes todos los días matan a la gente. Y había guerras de la esmeralda, una guerra de esmeraldas y por aquí estoy y ahí estamos sobreviviendo. Muchos amigos los mataron por nada. It was dark days. Coming to Colombia in those years was intense and, and because there was a, a war going on out in the emerald mining region. As nature would have it during those darkest years. Amazingly, the Coscoa's mine was putting out this beautifully saturated material that we could buy here as wholesalers for $800 per carat and sell all day long up in Los Angeles for $1,100 or $1,200 a carat. And so us emerald dealers, the few of us that were coming to Colombia, there weren't many, we kept coming and moving emeralds because it, it was good business, but we would come and our friends would tell us, well, so-and-so got shot, you know. But we kept coming, we, we had to do business. I'm just breaking the ice here. What I'm looking for is, is way better, greener and more transparent. The love of a green mineral. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'm waiting for my change. And money continues to drive a business that brings huge profits for the middleman. This is a 2,000 carats. Exporters pay 1% back to the local community. Around 500 million pesos. This is the cost. So we try to make a necklace. It takes a trained eye to see a necklace in raw, uncut stone. And it has one stone here. It would yield maybe a four or five carat stone. A stone here that, if the cutter is good, this would yield a nice four carat stone that might uh, bring some profit. So it's kind of a sport and it's kind of a business. Emerald cutting is an art that can turn a dull rock into a rich jewel. A skilled cutter will trim away the flaws creating a sparkling gem that will catch the light and the eyes of a rich buyer willing to spend a fortune. Every gemstone has that hidden glint of beauty that only a good cutter can bring out. More than two-thirds of a stone can be lost to create a finished gem. Large jewels are rare, a matching pair even rarer. The emerald earrings that adorned Angelina Jolie at the Oscars ceremony were worth two and a half million dollars. But big isn't always beautiful. Brokers just couldn't find a buyer for the massive Bahia emerald. The gigantic gem unearthed in Brazil was back underground stored in a variety of hiding spots while dealers dithered until an alleged billionaire appeared with a deal that seemed too good to be true. A big gun was brought in to find a buyer for the biggest emerald in the world. The seemingly high-flying businessman Larry Beagler was allegedly promised a whopping 50% commission. By April of 2008, they think they got a buyer out of Florida who's represented by a guy named Jerry Ferrara. Larry Beagler come off as a charming, uh, educated gentleman, uh, someone of high net worth, uh, the type of personality you would expect of an individual of that level. 
he uh, and Bigler hit it off well. And Bigler says, listen, I, I think you can sell it better than I can sell it, Jerry. I'm not being successful. So I'll tell you what, I'm going to assign it and sell it to you, Jerry. And then if you sell it, you'll give me 50% of what you, Jerry, get, and you get to keep the other 50%. Larry approached me with the opportunity to sell the Bahia Emerald, um, which I had jumped at. He was jumping into a dubious deal. Larry Beagler seemed genuine, an entrepreneur as elegant and impressive as the Bahia Emerald itself. When Larry showed up, Larry had a manila folder with him, and in the manila folder was the ownership documents which signed all ownership of the Bahia Emerald over to me. And dumbfounded that I've never met this man before in my life. Why would he sign over a $372 million stone to me? Larry's explanation was that he was extremely impressed with my ability to negotiate deals, my trustworthiness, and who I was as a businessman. So Jerry says, yeah, I think I can sell it. Well, he was impressive. I had no reason to doubt who he was and who he said he was. Larry Bigler apparently presents himself as a very wealthy individual with a lot of contacts. Uh, he had uh, shown himself to be a billionaire, a very wealthy man married into the Rockwell family. Our agreement would be, if you sell the stone, we'll divide it 50 by 50. I'm not going to back away from that. The deal seemed even sweeter when the emerald was unveiled to him in a Californian vault. That was the first time I saw the stone, and it was a spectacular scene, something I've never laid eyes on before. It'd be like stumbling onto King Solomon's mine. All the treasure movies you see on TV is nothing in comparison to walking into a room and having this thing just open itself to you. It was massive. It was 180,000 carats, 840 pound emerald sitting there in front of me. But Jerry and Larry Bigler are also doing other business deals together. Okay, and Larry tells Jerry, I got some diamonds that we can go out and sell. I had a lot of individuals that were interested in purchasing diamonds. So Jerry's out there kind of as a front man for Larry. And Larry Beagler had disclosed to me that he owns several diamond mines in Brazil and in Africa. And I said, let's sell some stones. Let's sell some diamonds while we're still working the Bahia Emerald deal. Diamond buyer Kit Morrison was about to be drawn into the Bahia Emerald saga. And this guy named Kit Morrison, who lives in Idaho, hears that there's some diamonds for sale that, you know, he would think if, I'm, if I buy it for X and I can sell it at a higher price at Y, I can make some money. The first time I spoke to Kit Morrison, he was on the market for buying diamonds. Brought the uh, diamond deal to me, which I had interest, but they needed a certain amount of money up front. Jerry says, well, you have to put like a million, million and a half or two million dollars down on the table for my partner my undisclosed partner, Larry Bigler, to show you the diamonds. He said, hell no, I wouldn't do that. I'm not gonna put up a certain amount of money without having a collateral asset. Let me offer you a potential solution here. I do own the world's largest emerald. Jerry says, I own this Bahia emerald. Uh, we can use that as an asset. So Jerry, at some point in this negotiation process, tells Kit, listen, if you put a million, million five on the table, or a million three, which is what it ends up being, if the diamonds don't come through, I will convey the ownership rights of the Bahia Emerald to you. When I first saw the Emerald, it's in a great big crate that almost looks like, you know, Indiana Jones crate, right? But it's, it's something that you don't expect. Even though you see it in documentation, you hear about it, you talk about it, it's, it's, it's something to see. Certainly one of the wonders of the world that, that yeah, I guess you could say it does give you chills to lay eyes on it, be standing in the same room with it. So Kit says, all right, I'll put the money down, which he did, 1.3 million. And 
the diamonds didn't show up. The day the stones were supposed to be picked up, they didn't show. I couldn't get Larry Beagler on the phone. Larry had completely dropped out of sight. The brilliance of the Brazilian gem seemed to blind even the most experienced operators. The gem business is riddled with potential pitfalls. Even genuine deals in the Colombian gem mecca of Muzo must be conducted with caution. This is one of my regular stops in the Emerald Mining region. Uh, this is the Plaza Central of Muzo, the town square. And every day there's people here selling emeralds. Not just to sell to foreigners like me or buyers from Bogota, they sell to each other. In the United States, nobody understands rough emeralds. And a Colombian can look at a rough emerald and start to get intoxicated by the emerald fever that maybe he can make a nice faceted stone out of that, and sell it and make a lot of money. Bonita, no? Parejas. Sí. Le ofrezco siete millones las dos piedras. <laughs> I think they are worth seven million pesos and not much more. That's four thousand dollars. I know. I know. I know. Like I say, it's, it's a, a business based on human relationships and face-to-face -face negotiation. And how much desperation do they have to get the money? I don't know. And it happens that I only have 8 million pesos in my bag anyhow, so I'm getting up against uh, my own little barrier here. <laughs> when I go to Colombia and pay tens of thousands of dollars for a parcel of, of stones, judgment has to be right on. Not all that glitters is gold. That was especially true for those drawn into a complicated deal surrounding the Bahia Emerald. It was put up as collateral for a diamond deal. When the money was paid, but the diamonds didn't turn up, the supposed ownership of the emerald was transferred. The diamonds were originally offered up by alleged mine owner Larry Beagler, but when the gems failed to show, he disappeared. No communication whatsoever. Kit Morrison, on one side, is now calling me saying, what's going on? I'm holding the bag. I've got $1.3 million of this man's money that's already been distributed and a nightmare in front of me. Larry Beagler suddenly resurfaced with a sensational nightmare story of his own. Finally, I get a call from Larry Beagler, a distressed call on his cell phone. I can't talk long. They're allowing me to make one phone call. And the next day, we hear the story that he was picked up by Brazilians and he was kidnapped. I'm thinking, I'm going to go take these guys out. I'm going to go find them. I'm going to save Larry. Police report, Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. The victim said the kidnappers told him they were to collect $500,000 to set him free. The victim said he would be able to give it to them after he had completed the sale of the Emerald Cluster. The Brazilians supposedly drop Larry off at the airport in Washington, and where does he fly? To, to Las Vegas to stay at Circus Circus. He doesn't fly home to tell people he's okay and embrace his family through this tragic kidnapping. He goes to, to Las Vegas and, and hangs his hat and kicks his feet up at Circus Circus, so. Things weren't adding up. Nothing was adding up. Once again, the sparkle of the world's largest emerald brought nothing but strife.
the whole world comes to Bogota, Colombia for emeralds. Gem dealing can deliver sky high profits, but legitimate deals are the results of hard work and a long chain of supply, usually hidden from view. Gem dealers make a point of being low profile. So uh, having a camera crew follow me is a little bit odd. We're going to the Emerald Trade Center, which is one of four major buildings that are completely full of emerald cutters, emerald dealers, and emerald brokers. We're one step up the ladder here. We're gonna see the professional gem brokers who move this industry. The Colombian capital of Bogota is a commercial center for the emerald trade. All of the precious stones mined or scavenged from rivers and tailings end up there. Estoy mirando para ver si hay piedras que me sirven, piedras de todos los cinco quilates cristal. Look at how the emerald goes down the sides. It's not worth very much, but it's a pretty stone. That's quite rare. Whenever there's a recession, they say, oh, Ron, how can you do business? You're in a luxury business selling gemstones. And I go, no, emeralds are not a luxury. Emeralds are a necessity. If any man falls in love and has to cover for some dumb mistake he made, he needs gemstones. It's a necessity, it's not a luxury. Bueno, I'm gonna look at these upstairs in the buying office, because I, I might buy one of them. The real action and the power and for me, the real intoxication is upstairs in the buildings where the emerald exporters are and the emerald dealers. I think emerald negotiation is very much like poker. You cannot give away how eager you are to have something. You want the, the owner of the stone to think that it was an afterthought that you want to buy that stone. You don't want him to know that you're like a lover inside. You're melting inside. You're desperate. You hope the phone rings. You hope the, the valentine comes. I'm a uni medium. You're thinking about that stone constantly until you own it. <laughs> so. My offer of two and a half million pesos needs to go up a little bit. The new bid was sealed in the traditional way. The broker would discuss the bid with the owner. She left carrying about a quarter of a million dollars worth of emeralds in her canvas bag. She was one of many middlemen who take a cut along the chain of trade that leads from the mine to the jewelry shop. The end buyer pays top dollar. Emeralds are really about passion, that allure, that beauty that you'll see in the finest jewelry on the wealthiest people in the world. It's all about power and pure romance. But power and romance was in short supply for those snared in yet another deal gone sour for the Bahia Emerald. One would think that the sale of the world's largest emerald would be straightforward. But self-proclaimed entrepreneur and broker Larry Beagler was one of many claiming ownership. Larry hears about it and thinks he's getting ripped off. Larry called me immediately, started blowing up my phone. Well, you can't move the stone, it's my stone. I said, it's not your stone, we lost it. We had to move it, we're gonna sell it to settle this debt. Larry goes to the police department 
and says, hey, that was mine. They stole it. And Larry shows him a bill of sale that stops with Larry. Doesn't show him his conveyance to, to Jerry. The Lieutenant Grubb of the Major Crimes Division took this very seriously. He says, a, you know, a couple hundred million dollar stone. The LAPD acted as if the stone had been stolen. Kit Morrison was accosted by the LA Sheriff's Department in his home in Boise, Idaho, when the LA Sheriff's Department would fly up there in an unbelievable act of aggression. Knocked on the door. They knew I wasn't there. And um, they talked to my wife. They were certainly aggressive in the measure that they took uh, to procure the asset. Where they got the authority to be that aggressive and to uh, cross state lines, I don't know, and I, I don't care to comment. Grand Larceny is a very serious charge. Grand Theft, Interstate Transport. Transport. They wanted to uh, get the emerald. They wanted to take it with them on that day. My wife called me. I called my attorney, who ran over there. I said, it's a kid, instead of going to jail, because they were threatening to put him and myself in jail, just give him the stone. We got the ownership documents. We have the wire transfer. We're illegal. So let him take the stone. We'll go to California court. It'll be a short thing. The local media in Vegas was going crazy. The, the media circus in LA was going crazy over this thing. Well, unknown to us, there were several other parties where they felt they had an ownership interest in this stone. Like bean sprouts that come out of the ground. We have five different claimants to this rock. Up comes Thomas, out of nowhere. Says, wait a second. I know it was seven or eight years ago, but I bought this thing back in 2001. The title that he says to the stone was burned up in a house fire, apparently set by me. <laughs> you know, I burned his house down with the intention of destroying his bill of sale. When we took a look at the testimony of Thomas, it was, it was almost a laughter. Uh, here's a person that claims that the only ind indicia that he has of purchasing the world's largest jewel is a vanished bill of sale that vanishes in a house fire and an insurance company has moved within 48 hours to bulldoze the house, and his bill of sale is in a fireproof vault, and he never gets back in time to check the vault. I mean, from beginning to end, that's a very shaky story. The legal battle continues to drag on. In appeal after appeal, five parties claim ownership. The Bahia Emerald is now worth millions of dollars more because it has a big nationwide story behind it. If everybody would just keep quiet, maybe Tony Thomas would go away and maybe we'll all be done with this. <laughs> it's such a weird story. If you think about it, this was like, this was the thing, you know, this was the great thing. But everybody had a creative way of trying to attach themselves to the stone. And when you find the ultimate treasure, I don't believe there's any stopping almost any individual from wanting to grab it and hold it and keep it. There was greed that was just kind of oozing out of a lot of people. A combination of that and I think a remarkable comedy of errors. I personally think the stone is cursed, so if we cut it up into pieces and everybody gets a little bit of nastiness and not every one person gets the whole hit, you know? The emerald worth hundreds of millions of dollars lies hidden in a police vault, waiting to be claimed again. Perhaps it was better left in the dark earth of a Brazilian mine. Anyway, that's the story. At the end of everything, fantastical.